from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching L'Oreal TV. Blessings, dear friends, and greetings in Jesus. My name is James Jacob Prash from Moriel Ministries. Happy to be with you. Most of my pre-tribulational friends will speak of the father of pre-tribulationism with some regard, even affection. I speak, of course, of Mr. John Nelson Darby from the 19th century. His ideas were later codified by others, including Mr. Schofield, but Mr. Darby is generally regarded as the founder of modern dispensationalism in its conventional sense, although the others believed versions of it at the same time or earlier than he did, and certainly its pre-tribulational ideas concerning the return of Jesus eschatologically. John Nelson Darby. And again, they speak of him with a very high sense of regard. But too often, most of them have no sense about what he really was, what he really believed, and why he was so unpopular among major respected evangelicals of his era, including other dispensationalists. People are often shocked when I point out that Charles Spurgeon took out full page ads in newspapers in London, warning people against John Nelson Darby. Why did Charles Spurgeon publicly warn people against him? Why did George Mueller, the great Christian activist on behalf of the poor children and evangelist to the homeless youth, why did George Mueller react publicly so strongly against John Nelson Darby? Why is it that D.L. Moody, the American evangelist, had such a low view of John Nelson Darby? Why did so many of the early people in the Brethren movement, such as James Grant, or the greatest Brethren scholar with an earned doctorate in Greek, Dr. Samuel Tregelis, much more formally educated in scripture and biblical languages than Darby, was Dr. Tregelis. And why did not only George Mueller, but so many of these other people like uh, Benjamin Newton, these are all early Brethren people who were with Mr. Darby from the beginning. Why did they all utterly, utterly repudiate him? Why did they all publicly distance themselves from him and even warn against him, even in full page ads? Why did Spurgeon seem so keen to warn the Christian public to keep away from John Darby? Why did D.L. Moody dislike him? Why did George Mueller? distrust him and dislike him? Why did major evangelical luminaries of the era, including other dispensationalists, including many of the founders of the Brethren movement, all warn people against John Darby? There's always been controversy surrounding him. Undoubtedly, at the power court conferences in Dublin, he had contact with some of the Irvingites an early charismatic movement that may have began well, but certainly went off the rails at an early point, as would later happen in Azusa Street in Los Angeles. Whether or not Mr. Darby adopted their ideas or not is often disputed, but that is not the point. We know what Mr. Darby was and what he did. Many cults, Adventist-type cults, began springing up in the 19th century. The Jehovah's Witnesses, beginning as the Dawn's Bible Society, began at that time. Mormonism began early in the 19th century. Seventh-day Adventism began early in the 19th century and gained momentum. And so, of course, did the closed brethren, the exclusive brethren. We can speak of Joseph Smith or Brigham Young 
We can speak of Charles Tazzy Russell or Rutherford. We can speak of Ellen G. White, and everyone would know that they are cult founders and cult leaders. But so was John Nelson Darby. The closed brethren, the exclusive brethren, exist until this day. There's over 40,000 of them in Great Britain. They're in New Zealand, Australia, other countries, but in Britain, 40,000. And like any other cult, they divide families. They can destroy marriages and do so. They are an utter cult. Mainstream brethren groups from Plymouth Brethren backgrounds, mainstream brethren groups warn against them, just as so many of the early brethren leaders, such as George Mueller, James Grant, Benjamin Newton, Dr. Samuel Tregalis, and other leaders of the early brethren warned against Darby. It's still going on. The open brethren are warning against the closed brethren. They are, in every sense of the word, a cult. It is irrefutable, undeniable, that John Darby was a cult leader. Now, when one understands dispensationalism, theologically and philosophically, nothing could be more contrary to dispensational thought than sprinkling infants and calling that baptism. A real dispensationalist wouldn't do that. They do not see an equivalency between the Hebrew rite of circumcision and infant baptism. Baptism is for believers, for those who are born again. Yet John Darby's followers to this day follow Mr. Darby's teaching to sprinkle infants. While claiming to be a dispensationalist, he's doing something completely anti-dispensational. He's sprinkling babies and calling these infants Christians. One of the most damaging things we can do is to baptize a baby and tell them that they're a Christian when they've not been born again as they grow up. Or you can confuse them by telling them they must be born again after they've been baptized as a baby. We're told in Romans we're baptized into the Lord's death. Nobody would take a baby out of a crib and put it into a casket and bury it if it wasn't dead. When you baptize an infant, you're telling someone they're a Christian when they're not. And then you have to explain why they need to become one. You're confusing them. It's totally unscriptural. Infant baptism is not biblical. But Mr. Darby, while claiming to be a dispensationalist, practiced it, taught it, and his followers do so to this day. How many people who are pre-tribulational believe in sprinkling infants and calling that baptism, as Mr. Darby did? How many subscribe to exclusivism, the sin of party spirit, saying that they're the one true church? I'm not speaking of Roman Catholicism's claims. I'm speaking of the claims of John Nelson Darby's followers. They claim to be the true body of Christ. And it has spurned other groups that others have called cultic, such as Witness Lee's followers, the local church. But they came from that same idea. They were all influenced by Darby, directly or indirectly. This man was a cult leader, and he did sprinkle infants. But now let's get into serious, serious heresy. How many of the people who believe in a pre-tribulation rapture would say that the epistle of James is not for the church? It's part of the Old Testament, and it's only for the Jews. How many pre-tribulation people who believe in a pre-tribulation rapture would say that the Gospels, the Sermon on the Mount, the Olivet Discourse are not for Christians, therefore Old Testament Israel? That the Gospels are part of the Old Testament. They're not for the church. That teaching is known as hyper-dispensationalism. And it influenced somebody called E.W. Bullinger who reformulated it into something called Bullingerism that was opposed by the great American pastor and Bible expositor Harry Ironside who challenged Bullingerism. But the source of Bullingerism was the 
false doctrine of John Nelson Darby, hyper-dispensationalism. It basically was a sanitized form of the ancient errors of Marcionism, drawing a radical distinction between the, the Testaments based on a wrong view of God. The Darbyists would believe that there's a different dispensation of grace now than existed in the first century. That the era of the church per se as it exists now began with Paul, not with Pentecost. That was a different era. That's what they teach. And from this, they derive such views as cessationism, finding a bedfellow in certain Calvinistic schools of thought that were initially founded by Benjamin Warfield, B.B. Warfield, the idea that the gifts of the Spirit ended with the apostles. Well, Darby's followers followed that. How can a Pentecostal preacher, a Pentecostal pastor, follow Darby when Darby said that you are a teacher of error and a deceiver because you believe the gifts of the Spirit still exist in the church? It's automatically contradictory. How can you be Pentecostal or charismatic and believe in Darby? Darby would have called you heretical. He was a cessationist. He believed that major portions of the New Testament, certainly the Epistle of James and the Gospels, were part of the Old Testament, not for the church. And from this, he gets the idea that the Olivet Discourse, Matthew 24, Luke 21, etc., that's for the Jews, not for the church. This is the root of his pre-tribulational thinking. Oh, that stuff is for the Jews. It's not for the church about the return of Christ. We won't be here. That's where it comes from. Now, I know that most people who are pre-tribulationists don't sprinkle babies. Most people who are pre-tribulationists don't subscribe to exclusivism or the sin of party spirits. Most people who are pre-tribulationists do not believe the epistle of James is part of the Old Testament or that the Gospels are for the Jews. They're part of the Old Testament, not for the church. They don't believe that. They find such views heretical. Yet they follow Mr. Darby, who taught and practiced all of these things. Face the fact, if you're pre-tribulational, you are following a cult leader. You are found, following a man who founded a cult, a real cult, a cult that still exists. In Britain, our ministry once had a woman saved, born again, who was 34 years in Darby's cult, the closed brethren, and didn't know she wasn't saved because she was sprinkled as an infant and brought up in that cult. 34 years in it and wasn't born again. Darby's real followers don't even consider you to be a Christian if you're not in their group very often, or at least, at best, a very misguided one. And if you're charismatic or Pentecostal, forget about it. Your theology does not make a lot of sense. You're following somebody who would have taught against what you are and what you believe. It is a theology that is cultic. Darby was despotic. Charles Spurgeon, his contemporary, knew that and warned against him. George Mueller, a great saint of God, who himself was brethren and dispensational, knew that and warned against him. So did many others. D.L. Moody just did not like him, with good reason. These are great men of God who knew Darby, who were his contemporaries, and warned the church, keep away from that man. Well, I'm only telling you today what Spurgeon told Christians. We're only telling you today what James Grant told Christians. We're only telling you today what George Mueller told Christians concerning John Nelson Darby. 
His doctrines are dangerous and false. He's a cult leader. Keep away from that man. God bless.